welcome everybody who's joined us tonight to CMJ's Bible Week. It's always exciting to have three talks all in a row on the same theme or subject. And I'm really looking forward to hearing Alex's um, unwrapping Luke's gospel for us in, in really new ways. And I hope it will lead to questions and discussion. And if you do have questions and discussion, there's the chat. Um, and if we only take a couple of questions tonight, I will put them onto slides ready for tomorrow so we can put them to Alex to answer tomorrow, tomorrow evening's Bible study. So right now, I would like to just go through one or two of those notices with you and just talk a little bit about them. And, um, and this is it. So, uh, so uh, uh -huh. go back to the beginning, I think. But Alex is uh, speaking on these three evenings tonight, and then he's going to be uh, tonight. It's on chapter two of Luke's gospel. Tomorrow he'll be going on to fifteen. Chapter 15, um, The Greatest Teacher. And the third night, on the 1st of December, on Thursday, he'll be looking at One Step Beyond from Luke 24. That's the passage that, when I became a Christian, it was reading that passage. It seemed to me people were speaking in animated ways. And actually, it's a description. But here's Aaron Imey following hot on um, mm -hmm. Alex's heels. <laughs> I fight off. Flown away already. And uh, he's going to be joining me on a short deputation tour of just a few meetings, but one will be an open meeting for everyone to come to. Uh, we will be in Dewsbury, we'll be in Preston, we'll be in Doncaster, but that's a particularly sensitive meeting, and so it's private. And also uh, in workshop for an afternoon together, that will be exciting. Friday the 9th of December at 7.30, it's an open meeting for you to join us again. And, uh, and bring your friends and hear what Aaron has to say about the connections between the Maccabees, the New Testament, and between Hanukkah and Christmas. Um, you saw just then that we were advertising our conference for next year, and that's going to be very special. Um, and we also want you to know that our website is always open for you. And uh, there's always something interesting to read from Alex's blogs, to all sorts of things. And we now can be in contact on media in one, two, three, four, five, six different ways. So there's something for everybody. Um, I hope that you will look up, keep in touch with us, keep up to date with the things that we're doing. Don't forget when you look on our website to look in the calendar for which events are coming up. And we'd like to thank you. Um, and if you want to donate to us tonight, there is a a link there, the code that you can scan, or you can just ring up the office <laughs> or go on our website. But I really would like to thank you for joining us and sharing this evening with us. Um, now, Alex, um, he's my boss, and so it's really quite funny to introduce him. But Alex is a Londoner. Uh, and he grew up mainly in Worcestershire and in Sussex. So uh, he's already been in sort of three different areas of uh, Britain, but I think that's really quite um, something because he then went on to Manchester. So that's London, Worcestershire, Sussex, Manchester, um, and being ordained into the URC church in 1985. Alex then went on to three different places. So he went to Lichfield, Aylesbury, and Linton, which is in Cambridgeshire. Now, Linton is uh, the place where he still actually lives. Um, and he'd been the minister there at the URC church. And now he's kind of a, a quiet back pew, um, whatever they call them in parliament, Alex, but uh, a backbencher, except he's sometimes just step forward and take services. So then from being a URC minister, Alex went on to work for CMJ. And that was 2006. And it was following a call that he had sensed whilst a student when he was working on a kibbutz. He felt called that one day he would work amongst the Jewish people. Well, of course, 
and that turned out to be true. So with an MA and an MPhil behind him, Alex has served in advocacy and introducing Jewish people to their own Messiah with CMJ. He's traveled widely as well, speaking in quite a few different places and written several books. Um, his most sought after book is the uh, Case for Enlargement Theology. The Case for Enlargement Theology is really quite a tome and it's, uh, it's very popular and it's, uh, it's made a vital contribution to the debate on the Jewish Christian relations. So if you're really interested to see what it's about, it can be bought from the online bookshop on CMJ's website. So another thing about Alex is he enjoys really hot Indian food, which I think is just as well, because he's recently developed his role with CMJ. So a quarter of his time is going to be as an international facilitator, helping the various established and emerging CMJ branches to strengthen and move forward. Alex, I think India is just waiting for you. Now, Alex is married and he's married to Mandy. They've got three grown up children and one granddaughter. He's got a bit of catching up to do. He enjoys playing golf, teaching chess and watching football. Though not tonight, Alex, but still it's only England playing. Now, if it had been Cambridge United Football Club, well, that might have been a very different story. So, as I said at the beginning, if you have any questions, please put them in the queue list or email them to enquiries at cmj.org.uk or me, Jane M at cmj.org.uk. Alex, you're a clear, well thought out Bible teacher. And we're excited to hear your talk now from Luke chapter two. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you very much, Jane. I hope you can all hear me out there on the webinar. Uh, thank you, a uh, couple of thank yous to start. Well, thank you, Jane, for that introduction. Uh, it was really very, <laughs> very encouraging. Um, and um, also thank you for hosting these meetings. Um, I guess some of us know that we've had a series of these Bible teaching meetings um, over a number of, of sessions, over a number of, of months now. And it's, it's my joy to be able to speak uh, tonight and again tomorrow, and as Jane said, finally on Thursday. Um, so thank you, Jane, for hosting this. Thank you for those participants who are joining us live. And we also are going to put this on the YouTube channel, the CMJ YouTube channel. So you may well be listening to this later on at your own convenience. I'd also like to thank uh, Philippa. Um, Philippa works as our social media officer and Philip has done all the slides. Um, she's put some lovely images on the slides. So very much a team evening tonight with Jane hosting and with uh, my colleague uh, Philippa doing the graphics for the slides. So. Um, I can take no credit for the slides. That's all down to, to Pip, to Philippa. Okay, I also want to thank you for joining us live tonight, if you are. I mean, uh, obviously, if you're England or Welsh supporter, your sacrifice today is well uh, celebrated by people. And we do pray for God's blessing on the England team and also on the Welsh team tonight, but perhaps slightly less on the Welsh than on the English. But I'm not going to go there. We're going to wait to see what happens. Okay. Um, so let's just pray together, and then I'm going to start, as Jane said, looking at Luke 2. If you've got a Bible with you, it might be worth opening that at Luke chapter 2. We're going to be focusing on verse 22 um, down to verse 52. So that's the kind of um, the main area we'll be looking at. We'll also be focusing on one or two other texts around that. But the main body of the material will come from Luke 2, beginning of verse 22, and from uh, up to the end of the chapter, that's verse 52 of Luke. But let's begin with prayer and just ask for God's blessing on all of us listening live and those of us who will be joining in later via the YouTube channel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, in your son Jesus Christ is hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Touch our hearts and our minds by your Holy Spirit and give to each one reverence and humility. For without these gifts, it is impossible to receive the truth. In the name of Yeshua, 
Amen. So as Jane said, I'm going to be looking at three sessions over the next three days. Each session will stand on its own. So if you can only join us for one, that's, that's fine. But they are also connected. And if you can stay with us for the three nights, I think you will sense a kind of connectedness. And hopefully you'll sense, you know, a kind of a sense in which one session leads on to the next. Um, so if we can just um, go to our, our first slide, Jane. So that's, yeah, that's welcoming people. Here we are. Excellent. So as I said, we're looking at Luke 2, 22 to 52. I hope to speak for about 40 minutes and then uh, we'll, we'll hopefully may have a little bit of time for questions, but um, we'll see how we get on. Um, now I'm using the new international version. Um, that's a version my home church uses. I know it's not everybody's first choice, but if you're following this with other translations, that's absolutely fine as well. But I've prepared this material using the new international version. So I'm looking at three sessions, the beginning here in Luke 2, beginning at Luke 2, 22, and then looking at the teaching material in Luke 15. Luke 15 has three parables which Jesus told, um, beginning uh, with uh, the last sheep and then moving on to the last coin and the last son. Now, if you're interested in doing a bit of background work for tomorrow before we look at uh, Luke 15, you can go onto our YouTube channel and you'll see a little series I did um, a few months ago called Seven in Seven. And in that little series, I look at seven parables of Jesus, each one in about a seven minute slot. And that will give you some helpful background if you've got time to look at those uh, before tomorrow evening. And then the final session is based on Luke 24 which is the story of the Emmaus Road. And again, um, some of the ideas for the Emmaus Road teaching I've actually taken from a forthcoming Olive Press paper by written by one of our uh, supporters of CMJ, Frank Booth. So uh, um, I, I've taken one or two of Frank's ideas as well. So I want to acknowledge Frank as a helpful source for my final session on Luke 24. So as you can see, I'm looking at three sessions from Luke's gospel. And uh, you might want to ask the question, why, why have you chosen to focus on Luke's gospel? Um, well, this is a quote here from John Proctor's book, Luke, Luke's Jesus, the message and meaning of Luke's gospel. As you'll see on the slide, it's from the Grove Biblical Series. Anything in the Grove Biblical Series, I think is really good. And this introduction to John's gospel, uh, to Luke's gospel, sorry, by John Proctor, is really very good. And uh, I just want to give this quote from John Proctor here. And it says, Luke is the longest of the gospels. And for many people, its picture of Jesus is the most natural and attractive of the four. I like that, that phrase, the most natural and attractive of the four. And I think. Um, when we look at Luke's gospel, you'll realize that uh, there are certain kind of trends or, or, or focal points in Luke. So, for example, uh, Luke, along with Matthew, are the only gospels which have the birth stories. So as we approach Advent into Christmas, uh, often we'll be reading from Luke or Matthew. And there's some material around the birth of Jesus, which is unique to Luke's, go Luke's gospel. So if people are reading about the life of Jesus for the first time, it seems to me very natural to begin with his birth. And therefore, we only have that in Luke or Matthew. We also have in Luke's gospel a tremendous interest for people who may in some ways be marginalized. There's a great emphasis in Luke's gospel on the role of women and also on the role of outsiders who are brought into God's purposes. Now, we use the word today inclusive, and I think in many ways you could say Luke's gospel is the most inclusive of the four gospels. Now, I think we're using that word perhaps in a different way to how it's used in some contemporary cultures. But there's, there's a form of inclusivity in Luke, which I think many people will find very attractive. It also has a great focus on the healing ministry of Jesus, your senses as you go through Luke's gospel. A more detail is given to the healing ministries in Luke than in, in some of the other gospel accounts. Why? Well, we understand that the writer of the gospel, Luke, is also a medical doctor. So he's giving a kind of account and a reflection on the events 
you know, using that insight as, as a medical practitioner. So the importance of the birth, the importance of women, the importance of outsiders, the focus on the healing ministry, and the fact that it is the longest of the gospel. It makes me want to use Luke in introducing people to New Testament study. Um, so when I wrote the first in my series of little Bible books, I began with Luke's gospel. And this is written to, to encourage new believers, especially new Jewish believers in Jesus, to engage with the gospel material. And this is 100 days with Luke. So we go through Luke's gospel. Um, and in those 100 readings, we actually go through right from the beginning, right up to the final chapter, chapter 24. So for me, I would suggest that I want to start uh, with, with, with Luke. Um, the other question which we may have, okay, why are there then four Gospels anyway? Um, we, got the, we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Why, why are there four Gospels? And I just wondered how you may answer that. And I, I kind of try and give my answer early on in this book, 100 Days with Luke. And I, let me just read this to you. Luke is one of four gospel accounts in the New Testament. There's no definitive answer of why we are given four, but in my view, it is that God initiated this in order to give different yet complementary information and insights about Jesus. So if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will begin to see different pictures of Jesus. They'll have different insights, yet, there's never anything which is contradictory, but it is complementary. And I think that's very helpful to have those four different uh, pictures of, of Jesus. We're also told in the Torah, in Deuteronomy 17, that in order for an important decision to be made, there must be at least two or three witnesses. That's to do with the, uh, the, the legal code in the Torah. There must be two or three witnesses. You can't send someone to prison or take someone's life on, on just one eyewitness account. You need two or three. Now, in the gospel material, we, we have, we've gone even further than that. We have four accounts. So someone can say, how can I really know much about Jesus? Can I trust the material? And I would say, if you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you will get a full, comprehensive, uh, and a trustworthy account of Jesus. And you can respond to what you hear in, in, those, in those four Gospels. In terms of um, the different Gospels, um, just to say, I think each of them have their own particular style. As I said at the beginning, Luke, for me, is where I would want people to start. But you could make a case for Mark. Mark is the shortest Gospel. It's the most direct. It's very fast moving. And in some sense, that could be a good starting point. Um, some people would argue that Matthew is particularly relevant, perhaps particularly relevant for a Jewish audience, because Matthew makes lots of connections back to what we would call the Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures, the scriptures Jesus knew, and focuses a lot on some of the prophecies and how they're fulfilled in Jesus. And of course, for a Jewish inquirer, that can be especially helpful. And John takes us on a different kind of journey and give us, gives us a much wider theological picture of Jesus. And uh, so we can benefit, of course, from all four Gospels. But for me, as I said, I want to focus primarily on Luke. And I encourage people who are new to the New Testament to begin with the Gospel of Luke. If you begin with Luke, you may be interested to find out some further uh, books to help you with Luke's Gospel. I'm just going to recommend two to you. Um, one is a very good commentary, it's quite an old commentary now, by Leon Morris, written back in 1974, published by IVP, and I think that's, for me, one of the clearest introductions to, to Luke's Gospel. So, uh, Leon Morris, Luke, an introduction and commentary, and I think a book which many of us will know in the church's ministry among Jewish people, in, in our culture, in our context, is the New Testament commentary by David Stern. I think what David Stern does, which is unlike most of the other commentaries, he presents the gospel material within the Jewish contours. He has a great insight and a great appreciation of the Jewish context. So 
anything by David Stern, I think is really good. But I think to read his uh, New Testament commentary is a great place and it complements, it adds to some of the other commentaries which perhaps is, are less uh, familiar or less open to the Jewish context of the New Testament. So uh, those are just a couple of the books I would recommend if you want to go a little bit deeper tonight. So um, that's John Proctor's introduction, uh, Leon Morris's book and David Stern's book. And of course, you may want to look at my 100 Days with Luke as well. So that's just getting us started on, on this session tonight. So Jane, if we can just move to the next slide. Okay, so let's get now into the text. So um, that's a lovely graphic, isn't it, which uh, I said Pip has given to us. That's a picture of Jesus being presented in the temple. Now, this material is only in Luke's gospel. All the readings we're looking at in this little Bible week are unique to Luke's gospel. So just a little bit of background on that. Matthew, Mark and Luke are known as the synoptic gospels. They share a common uh, view of Jesus, while John is a different type of work. It's a different type of gospel narrative. So most people talk about the three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke and John. Most people, and I, I would certainly be in this camp, believe that Mark is the first gospel to be written. And Matthew and Luke, if you look at the material, they are using some of Mark's material as a primary source. They're drawing from Mark, but both Matthew and Luke add to Mark their own particular insights. And this is called special Matthew or special Luke. So the readings we're having over the next three days all come from the category of special Luke. In other words, they are unique to Luke. Somehow Luke, led by the spirit, through his various contacts, has brought into the gospel material which is not shared anywhere else. And I think that's always a, a great a great gift to the church that we have this material, which is special Matthew or special Luke. It certainly enhances the portrait of Jesus, which we have from Mark's gospel. I also believe um, that all three of the synoptic gospels are written before the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70, the, 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 the destruction of the temple and the fall of Jerusalem from 67 to 70. Um, I think that view now of the earlier dating of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark and Luke, is widely accepted by a lot of New Testament scholars. When I started training, Jay mentioned I started training for the ministry back in the early 1980s, I think that was quite a rare view. Most people were wanting to put Luke and Matthew certainly later around about AD 90 some people would date it so you've got a much longer period of oral tradition I think most scholars for a range of reasons we won't go into tonight are dating the gospels much earlier than was the traditional view when I started out doing some New Testament studies back in the 1980s so we're looking at this material it's special to Luke and uh, I think Luke's gospel was written probably around about five, ten years before the destruction of the temple. Now, this material, which is only in Luke, one of the things it does, and I think this is very important in a CMJ context, is that it affirms and highlights the Jewish identity of Jesus. So our very first verse from our reading tonight places the birth story in a Torah observant context. When the time came for the purification rites recorded by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. So this event, what is happening now, is not just a random event or the parents have chosen to do something. No, no, this is rooted in Mary and Joseph being a Torah observant couple and doing what the law of Moses uh, it requests them to do in terms of responding to the birth of Jesus. So I think it is very important to see this in, 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 a, in the sense of the identity of Jesus uh, as, as a Jewish baby. And then the verse 39, which concludes this first part of our reading tonight, it says this, verse 39, when Joseph and Mary had done everything 
required by the law of the Lord. They returned to Galilee, to their own town. And I think that sense of the kind of comprehensiveness of what Mary and Joseph does is really important. They didn't just pick and choose or do a few things. The text says clearly they did everything required by the law of the Lord, by the, 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 the Torah tradition. So I think it's really important that we see here that the birth narrative is rooted in the rich heritage of the Torah, and, and Jewish identity. We also see that this particular event where Jesus is presented in the temple is preceded in, uh, if we just go back one verse to verse 21 of chapter two, so this is just before the section I'm looking at, we have an event which again affirms the Jewish context of Jesus's life. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. So before the purification, Jesus is circumcised. This is a sign of a child of the covenant. So again, we see this very strong um, tradition here of Jesus fulfilling the Jewish uh, context of his life. Just one thing to focus on the circumcision of Jesus and I, I picked this up in 100 Days with Luke, and this again, just reading to you a paragraph from here. It says this, hopefully this is not a surprise to you listening tonight, but it is shocking surprise to many people that Jesus is Jewish. Here in chapter two, verse 21 of Luke, we're told about his circumcision. This was to mark and celebrate Jesus's covenantal identity with the Jewish people. Let me just read that again. This was to mark and celebrate his covenantal identity uh, with the Jewish people. So Jesus sheds his blood in the gospel material on three occasions. He sheds it firstly here uh, as a baby. And that shedding of his blood marks his covenant. It, it's, this, this shows that he is Jewish. The second time he sheds his blood is when he is preparing to face the ordeal of crucifixion. It, it talks about in the garden, Jesus began to, to sweat blood. This shows Jesus's humanity. If you put human beings, people like me and you, ordinary human beings under pressure, our bodies will break down eventually. And we see that in the body of Jesus. He's beginning to shed blood. This, this, this is a stress related condition. And uh, we see his humanity, his suffering, his vulnerability. There's nothing make-believe about this. This is real for Jesus. And he sweats blood. So the first time at the circumcision, the blood reminds us that he is Jewish. The second time reminds us that he is human. And the third time we see the shedding of the blood is when Jesus offers his life upon the cross as an atoning sacrifice for all people. This declares the divinity of Jesus and the reconciling love of God. So maybe we begin to understand Jesus, Jewish man and fully God, through the three times he sheds his blood in the gospel narrative. So we see here that the temple features often within the outworking of the events within the ministry of Jesus. The relationship between Jesus and the temple is a key ongoing relationship in the ministry of Jesus and the life of the church. Now, it's interesting, we often think about Luke's gospel as being particularly good for non-Jewish people. It, it's, it's got a kind of Gentile focus, but it's interesting that Luke's gospel here begins in the temple, and at the very end of Luke's gospel, where do we end up? If you go to Luke uh, 24, verse 53, let me just uh, whiz through the longest gospel, to the end here in verse 52 and 53, then they, that's the disciples of Jesus, they worshiped him. Hear that, they worshiped him. You know, here we are in a strictly monotheistic religion where the oneness of God, the purity of God, but they recognize that in seeing the risen Jesus, the most appropriate action is one of worship. They worship him and return to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stay continually where? at the temple, praising God. So Luke 
bookends his gospel with the temple. Here, with the birth, the circumcision, the dedication, and at the end, with the worshipping of the risen Lord, where in the temple courts. So the temple is the beginning and, and the end. And as you read through the book of Acts, you will see an interesting kind of relationship between the emerging messianic community, the emerging church and, and the temple. I just want to recommend to you one book on the link between Jesus and the temple, which I think is a really good book. It's by a Scandinavian scholar, Oscar Kosain, and it's called In the Shadow of the Temple. Um, it's an IVP academic publisher. Jesus, um, in the shadow of the temple, Jewish influences on early Jewish Christianity. If you want to dig deep and do some serious study, I do recommend this book by Oscar Skosain. Let me just spell his surname to you if you want to search for him. S-K-A-S-K-A-R-S-A-U-N-E. In the shadow of the temple, Jewish influences on early Christianity. So we look at what happened here in the temple. It's interesting that it says here that when the time came for the purification, as required by the Torah, we mentioned that earlier, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So Jesus is, is taken to Jerusalem. There's a sense in which at this moment, Jesus is, is, is very uh, uh, vulnerable in in that sense, he, he has no control over what happens to him. He is, as a young baby, dependent on mum and dad. Later in his life, when Jesus goes to the cross, again, he is vulnerable. Things are being done to him. He is arrested. He is taken. He is beaten. He is tortured. He is crucified. There's a sense of vulnerability. And I'm just reflecting on that in um, the little book, A Hundred Days with Luke. And I just wanted to, to reflect on this. Um, and maybe this is a kind of a spiritual challenge uh, to all of us. Um, I, guess, I guess all of us want to be in control. You know, we want to be kind of in charge of our own destinies. We, we want to be able to be in positions of power. But um, it's interesting that Jesus at the most powerful moment in his ministry, becomes incredibly vulnerable. He says this, um, amazingly, the cross becomes a place of witness. Both Simon at the beginning of the crucifixion and later the criminal and the centurion, they all recognize something significant about who Jesus is. Maybe this is the most powerful reminder that we don't need to be strong or in control to be a witness for Jesus. Maybe it is at times of our weakness that the strength and love of Jesus can be most clearly seen by others. I find that's a challenge. You know, I want to be upfront. I'm, I'm a leader, I'm a teacher. But maybe people will see more of Jesus when I'm an old man in an old people's home and, and I have no, I'm reliant on other people. Maybe it's something that Jesus will shine through which they don't see in a confident person today. So there's something about vulnerability here, which I think is important. And here at his circumcision, Jesus was taken. And later in his life, he's taken to the cross. He's no longer controlling his own destiny in that sense. Okay, Jay, can we just go back a slide? I think we jumped forward one too many there. Can we just go back one? Yeah. So there, here we are. Thank you. So let's look again at this text. What do we see here? That... Jesus is born into this rich heritage of faith. In chapter two, we see the ministry of, um, sorry, in chapter one, we see the ministry of Zachariah and Elizabeth, which provides the context. And then we see later the ministry in chapter two of Simeon and Anna. And we see that they are waiting faithfully in the temple. And just like Joseph and Mary, they, they, are, they are keeping Torah. They, 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 they know from the scriptures that something is going to happen. The Messiah is going to come. And they're, wait, they're waiting faithfully in the temple. I just want you to just explore that idea of waiting faithfully. Isn't it interesting that Luke's gospel begins with these people waiting, particularly Simeon and Anna? And how does his second book begin? 
Acts chapter 1, we have the early church waiting in Jerusalem, maybe very close to where Simeon and Anna were waiting. There's a sense in which this work is something which we can't engineer ourselves. Simeon and Anna knew they had to wait for God's Messiah to come. That was going to be in God's time. And the early church knew they could not go out and proclaim the resurrection in their own strength. They may be successful to some extent, but it's not going to have any lasting impact. They knew they had to wait for the empowering of the spirit. So the importance of waiting, it's at the beginning of the life of Jesus and it's at the beginning of the life of the church. And that reminds us as followers of Jesus that the issue of waiting upon the Lord, learning to recognize the Lord's timing is so important in our ministries, in our churches, and in our own personal lives. I feel sometimes, you know, I've tried to rush ahead of God and, you know, full of 500 good ideas before breakfast, but most of those have got nothing to do with God. Or sometimes maybe the opposite is true. Maybe it depends a bit on your personality, but you hold back. God's opened the door, but you won't walk through it. You're just waiting. You're, you're, you're Mr. Ultra Cautious. But we need to make sure we're walking in God's timing. And that's where the waiting upon the Lord is really important. We see it here with Simeon and Anna. We see it, of course, in the beginning of the book of Acts. And then we also see in um, this section where Jesus is presented in the temple, we see this rich fulfillment of faith. We see that in the songs which are sung. Now, Luke focuses a lot on the songs. Mary's song in chapter one, uh, Zachariah's song of blessing, and now Simeon's song of praise in chapter 2, 29 to 32. Again, I, you know, read those songs of praise over the next few days of Advent. Let those songs kind of bring you joy. Now, in those songs, um, that's uh, Mary's song, Zachariah's song, and Simeon's song, there is such a range of Old Testament themes and promises. It's incredible. We could do a whole study on those songs because they got so much material. But I think it's important to, to know, really, that in, in the Old Testament, it seems to me that when God breaks through into, the, into a particular situation, when God is at work, that is always reflected in a song. So you think of um, you know, the song uh, after the Exodus, uh, you know, when we have that great outpouring of praise. In the Psalms, we see this same sense of, of the outpouring of praise. And, and, and Psalm 40, which is probably one of my favorite Psalms, makes this point very clear. Let me just read to you from Psalm 40, verse three. Um, he put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. So the psalmist recognizes the Lord has given him a song to celebrate the work which God is doing. And I think we see that throughout church history. Every time there's a moment of revival or renewal in the church, what happens? People begin to be creative. They begin to write poems. They begin to write songs. They begin to uh, express worship in new and deeper ways. So it's interesting here that we have something which I think is rooted in the Old Testament, but it continues into the life of the church, that when there is a sense of praise, a sense of breakthrough, a sense of fulfillment, wow, what do we do? We praise God in songs. And we have these three songs here recorded for us in, in, Luke's, in Luke's gospel. So in all of this, Jesus moves forward from this heritage of faith. Jesus is, is it is part of that larger story. So when we're sharing the good news of Jesus with our Jewish friends, with our Jewish colleagues, uh, what, what we're saying is this is not my story, which I'm imposing on you to hear, but this is your story. This is a story which connects right back to, to the priestly families of Zachariah and Elizabeth. It connects to these faithful Jewish people, Simeon and Anna. It connects back to the Torah. It connects back to these songs of praise throughout Jewish history and scripture. This is your narrative and uh, engage with it if you, if you can. But at the end of this little section is the point which I think is foundational to the ministry of CMJ. And I think is really crucial to understanding who Jesus is. And uh, this, this is uh, in, in Luke 2, verse 32, that at the end of all of this, it says this, that the Messiah, Jesus, is a light for revelation to the Gentiles, to the nations, out into the farthest corners of the world. And many, many churches are really good at that. 
as a missionary concern to go out, wonderful, to every person, to every group, every tongue, every tribe, because that's what we should do, because Jesus is a revelation for the nations, to the Gentiles, but also equally, and the glory of your people Israel. And I think one of the things which CMJ's ministry has been saying to the church now for over 200 years, yes, we rejoice in the mission to the whole world, but let's also remember the mission to the Jewish people, the witness to the Jewish people, because Jesus cannot be understood if you simply see him as uh, a revelation to the Gentiles. You have to also appreciate and invest in the fact that Jesus is also the glory of the people of Israel. So if we take Jesus out of his Jewish context, we actually do something foundational to the person and work of Jesus. So for me, as I celebrate Advent, I want to say to all my church friends, especially those who aren't particularly involved in, 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 in CMJ, is, is to say this, that yes, of course, Jesus is for the whole world. But he's also especially uniquely to the glory of Israel. And we need to understand that. So there are two sides of the same coin. Um, it's not, you know, either or, it's both and. And we need to really hold that close to our hearts that Jesus is the revelation to the nations and also the glory to Israel. Okay, um, time's moving on. Let me move on to our next slide. Thanks, Jane. Okay, so this is now the second part of the session, really. We, we've looked at the uh, presentation of the temple, and now Jesus returns to the temple, probably, you know, 12, 13 years later. Uh, and this story here is, again, unique to Luke. As I say, all the things I'm looking at in these next three nights will be unique to Luke. But also this is unique in another sense, is that it's the only part of Scripture where we have a glimpse, and it's only a tiny glimpse, of Jesus as a teenager. We, we have no other information from Jesus' birth, apart from the fact that he goes down to Egypt um, with mum and dad to escape the paranoid King Herod. He comes back later, and we have no information about that. We had a great silence. Um, but we have this little glimpse from Luke. And I, just think, I think it's really, really special to have that, to have this little glimpse here. It's one of my favorite parts of, of, of the New Testament, because we, we got this glimpse of Jesus uh, as, as, as a young, young teenager. So it says here in verse 41, every year Jesus's parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of uh, Passover. If you're familiar with CMJ's teaching, you will know that there's three pilgrim festivals. Um, that's Passover, Pentecost and Tabernacles. At those three festivals, it was expected that Jewish people would make an effort to go to Jerusalem to share in the celebrations in the temple. Now, if you were living a long way from Jerusalem, maybe you'd only make that journey once in your lifetime. But if you're in the land of Israel, you might make that regularly. And it seems that because Joseph and Mary were Torah observant, we're told that uh, it was their tradition to go every year. That, that was part of the kind of DNA of their family life. And not all Jews were able to obey that requirement. It was costly. And I guess the journey down from Nazareth would have been a difficult journey. But being observant and pious, they went every year. Their faith was shown by their actions. Um, and you know, that's, that's a challenge to us. You know, if people look at our lifestyle, you know, what would they see about us? You know, as Jane said in introduction, people would see me and they would know I'm a Cambridge United supporter, that I, that I like eating curry. I'm a Bob Dylan fan. There's enough evidence to convict me of all those things. I, I would have to plead guilty to those things. But what about my commitment to Jesus? Would people see that if you know, people don't know what I, who I work for, whatever? Would there be enough in that in my life to show that? Now, in the case of Mary and Joseph, their faith in the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob is shown how in very practical, costly terms. Every year they rock off down to Jerusalem, to the temple. And that's a big, big commitment. But they do that. Um, and we have this glimpse of what happens next when Jesus was, was 12 years old. Um, in kind of Jewish tradition, I think it kind of in the church tradition as well, that there comes a point where, where children are now responsible for their own relationship with God. They come to some age of responsibility. Um, 
and people before that are praying for them that you know people are kind of their godparents are praying and supporting children but there comes to a point where children are responsible that's not just reflected spiritually but is also affected in the legal code of most countries there's there's ages where people can be responsible for their actions there's an age of consent for example so we recognize that age makes a difference in terms of your own responsibility and in jewish tradition this is a moment where people transitioned from being a child into being responsible as as an adult for their life for their choices for their decisions so this is really for jesus this little glimpse is at this age of some sense of responsibility. Transition is taking place from a child into an adult life. Now, one of the things about modern life is that we have this huge expanse of teenage years uh, where you know, often people are sort of in this kind of limbo state where they're not children, but they're not really adults. Um, maybe we can be perpetual students and up until we're 40 or whatever. And there's this long, this, this is part of the, of the kind of revolution post 1960s. Someone says teenagers were invented in 1960. I'm not sure that was true, but we have this new kind of dynamic. But in the biblical times, that transition from a child to an adult will be very clear and it will, it will be a much shorter period than we tend to have in our culture. From the medieval period, the bar mitzvah um, became a major celebration within ceremonial Jewish life to mark this transition. Um, I think the picture which Pip has put up on the screen is of a young Jewish boy going through his bar mitzvah, reading the scripture for the first time and celebrating the fact that he is now part of the, the Jewish adult community of faith. Now, I don't think what is happening to Jesus here is a bar mitzvah. I think that comes later in Jewish tradition. But Jesus is recognized here in the temple as something significant is happening. Um, is that, is that, it is at this important age of 12 or 13 that this, this, this is taking place. And um, uh, I think that, that's an important point to pick up. So let's just move on to the to the next slide. Now I, lo I love this. I mean, um, those of us who have been parents will know that even the best parents can have bad days. And uh, we think of Mary and Joseph being these great parents, these Torah observant, pious people doing all the right things. But they kind of here they have a bit of a blot on their CV that uh, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. But they were unaware of it. Um, you know, I remember, I hope Mandy's not listening to this, but I remember once when I was responsible for, for two of my children, um, I was shopping with them and somehow we managed to, 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 to lose my oldest son, Luke. And uh, you know, anyway, um, the worst thing was before Mandy knew that I lost him, it came over the, the shopping tannoy in this big, big shopping centre that will the parents of Luke Jacob please turn up at this place? So I couldn't pretend I hadn't lost him. It, would be, it was obvious. And not only did Mandy know, but everybody else in, in the shopping centre was obviously. I had everybody's eyes on me as I scurried along to the, uh, to the kind of security area of the shopping centre. But I take some comfort that, you know, Mary and Joseph, these great parents, especially chosen by God to be the parents of Jesus, can also mess up. And uh, so, you know, th this is interesting. I think there was a sense in which Mary and Joseph would say in their defense, as the text says here, that somehow they went as a family group, an extended family. We're going to pick up a bit on the extended family of Jesus in the final session with the Emmaus Road. Um, I, I, I'm going to talk a bit about the extended family of Jesus. And they expected that somehow Jesus was with other people in the group, you know. Um, but it's interesting here that, um, you know, they, 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 Jesus was missing for three days. I mean, my kids were missing from me from about, I don't know, three minutes, 30 minutes maximum. And I was sort of in kind of super panic mode. But here, after three days, I can't, I mean, you can imagine what Mary and Joseph was, was going through. Um, I think the three days might be significant. A number of commentators pick up that Jesus was then lost in Jerusalem for three days from the viewpoint of, of Mary and Joseph. And Jesus was lost to the world for three days in the tomb uh, following his crucifixion. And of course, the book of Jonah talks about Jonah being in the fish for three days. So maybe Luke is saying, you know, if you've got eyes to see and ears to hear, 
think about three days. It's, it, there's, there's something here which is significant. Um, so I just wanted to, 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 to focus on, on that. But just to spiritualize the, uh, the losing of Jesus, um, I kind of pick up on that a little bit in um, uh, the book 100 Days of Luke. Let me just read to you something about, about how we might lose Jesus. It, it says this, and this is based on, on this story. Are you, am I, at times in danger of losing Jesus? Perhaps at times you drift away from your first commitment to him. Mary and Joseph seem to have physically lost Jesus, partly due to the huge crowds and partly due to the fact that they assumed that he was in their company and being cared for by others. But on this occasion, he was not. Can it be that we at times may identify spiritually with what happened to Mary and Joseph physically? Are we in danger of losing our close relationship with Jesus because of the pressure of the crowd? peer pressure? Or do we assume all is well when it is not? Or do we seek to evade our personal responsibility by relying on others to maintain our relationship with Jesus? It is always good to be supported in our commitment to Jesus by friends, family, and leaders, but we must never delegate responsibility for our relationship with Jesus to others. We must take responsibility for our discipleship and for maintaining our commitment to him. We and we alone are responsible for keeping Jesus close to us and making sure that we are close to him. So maybe there are times when we feel, you know, kind of adrift from Jesus or we, somehow we've lost him. And if, if you're struggling with that today, I just pray as we reflect on this, you will say, Lord, please, please bring Jesus closer to me or, or please help me to move closer to Jesus. And enjoying this period of Advent, as we approach the birth of Jesus, this can be a time when all of us can grow in our faith and we can sense that renewal. And if we've abandoned responsibility, if we've been lax in our commitment, then this is a time we can say sorry to the Lord and we can make that step back towards him. So can we at times lose Jesus? Absolutely, yes. Can that loss be restored? Absolutely, yes, by God's grace and by our recommitment to him. OK, let's so move on to the final couple of slides. So. Um, so when Jesus is lost in the minds of Mary and Joseph, we know that he's actually in the temple precincts and he is in verse 47. We're told that. Um, after three days, they found him in the temple courts. What was he doing? He was sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. I love that sense in which these two things are going on. There is a listening and an asking that that, that, they, that there's a kind of involvement here. Um, and and everyone who heard him were amazed uh, at his understanding and his answers. So Jesus is both receiving his listening, but he's also speaking into their lives. He's giving answers and, and people are amazed. Now, this is the first time in the gospel where we see that Jesus is teaching his answers are causing amazement, astonishment. And that is a theme which runs throughout the ministry of Jesus, that his ministry, his teaching brings amazement. Why? Well, there's lots of different reasons, but the primary reason is that Jesus taught with authority. In Matthew's gospel, we see this very clearly in Matthew 7, 28 to 29. So this is the conclusion of this great teaching section in Matthew, beginning with the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes, teaching about adultery, divorce, um, and teaching about love for our enemies, giving, teaching about prayer. And at the end of this great section, it says these simple words. When Jesus had finished saying all of these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. Why? Because he taught at, as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. So here in Luke chapter two, we see this beginning to take shape. Here Jesus as, as a young teenager has that ministry of teaching, which causes amazement. And that was developed later on through his public ministry. Now, if we just look at the text, I'm, I'm always intrigued by, by what, what is happening here. As Jesus goes into the temple, as he's teaching, as he's listening, his parents, you know, come up to him 
And uh, you know, it, it's just kind of a really strange, strange moment. You know, um, the, his mother said to him, you know, and you know, son, why have you treated us like this? I, I, I think there is, uh, there is something. I think there's an anger, there's a relief, there's all sorts of things. And often, when when a child needs discipline, is the mother who takes the lead. Is the mother who just, Joseph doesn't say much at this point, but but Mary is saying to him, you know. What's happening? You know, your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. I think that's a great understatement. I mean, they've they've just probably been, you know, desperate, desperate, desperate. Um, and then Jesus says this, and I think this is just so amazing. I think it is so innocent, and I think it's so genuine. It's so authentic. I think Jesus is gen is 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 just bewildered by what is happening. He said, "You know, why are you searching for me?" I mean, what could be more natural? Did, did you know? I had to be, I had to be in my father's house. But they did not understand what he was saying to them. I, I think there was this, this moment of communication which doesn't actually communicate with each other. Jesus is, is, is astonished by their bewilderment. That, well, where else would I be? Where else am I going to be? But in my father's house. It's interesting that he uses the phrase there in uh, in my father's house. Um, most people would have talked about the temple as the, the house, our father's house, a house belonging to the people collectively. But Jesus uses the term my, he, he, he's speaking very intimately. That, that he's claiming here a special relationship with his father. Now, I think this is kind of an interesting moment. So forgive me, I'm, I'm, get, I'm going to kind of speculate on this. But I know David Pelegi, the rector of Christchurch Jerusalem, has taught in the same way I'm teaching now. So it can't be heresy if I'm following the footsteps of the great David Pelegi. But the point where I think people are saying is, at what moment did Jesus know, was he fully conscious of his identity as the son of God? At what moment did he know of his special mission? And some people suggest, and I think I'm suggesting this here to you tonight, it was at that moment in the temple that he knew that he was God's son, my father's house. There's a special relationship. Later in John's gospel, he says, the father and I are one. Here he's beginning to explore and come to an understanding of that. Um, it's interesting also that Joseph was not his father. He was his adopted dad and had many rights and privileges as an adopted father. But I just wonder how Joseph would have felt in those words. You know, Joseph, you're, you're not my dad, are you? Some of us who have been adopted would, would know, you know, the joy of being in a loving adopted family, and that can be a wonderful gift and a wonderful privilege. But there's also a sense in which there may be some level of disconnection and maybe we're not aware of that disconnection until we become teenagers or until we become adults. But I just wonder how Joseph must have felt in my father's house at that moment. Anyway, that's 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 speculation. But I would just want to say in that moment, Jesus leaves his childhood behind. He realizes perhaps for the very first time his special relationship with the father and his own unique calling. Now, you could argue if that is true, the ministry of Jesus could have begun at that point. The public ministry could have begun at that moment. Um, and how different the gospel narrative would have been if we had Jesus beginning his public ministry at that point. I believe Jesus had the right to begin his public ministry there. He was aware of his identity. He was able to teach with astounding authority. Um, but the timing was not yet right. Now, remember, we began this session by looking at the importance of timing, that people had to wait for the Messiah. The early church had to wait for the spirit. Now, Jesus is modeling this same patience. He's waiting now. He waits for nearly 16, 17 years for his ministry to begin publicly. Um, and we know throughout ministry the importance of timing. People say timing is vital for comedians. It's also vital for Christian workers. We can sometimes do the right thing at the wrong time and ministry will not prosper. 
But for ministry to be effective, we have to be doing the right thing at the right time. And Jesus waits for 10, 15, 18 years for his public ministry to begin. He models our patience. He models that his determination to only minister in line with the spirit when the time is right. And throughout the gospel, you will see this phrase again and again. My time has come. My time has not yet come. So we see the importance of timing. And I think in CMJ's ministry, you know, we've been around now for over 200 years. There's been times when a particular part of our ministry has been particularly fruitful. That doesn't mean that people in the past were less faithful, but their timing wasn't yet right for a particular work or particular focus. So I think we've got to be very patient and gentle with each other and recognise that there are different times and seasons. Um, and this is we see here. So Jesus begins his ministry not here in the temple he waits and if we just read to the end of this this section that he goes back um, to Nazareth and he was obedient to his parents and uh, Mary his mother treasured all these things in her heart and Jesus grew up in wisdom and statue and in favor with God and man so Jesus is waiting he, he, he's waiting in the temple. Uh, he's waiting for his ministry to begin. We just go on to our final slide, Jane. So we're just coming into land now uh, for my Bible teaching for tonight. So, you know, put your seatbelts on, fold up your tray tables. We're coming into land. So Jesus now is waiting. He's modeling that waiting ministry. He waits in obedience. And he grows. He grows in his relationship with his calling and with his father. And Mary treasures all these things in her heart. Um, it's interesting, it says that in, in, in um, chapter 2, verse 51, um, that Mary, his mother, treasured all these things. The same phrase is used when earlier in the passage in Luke 2, 19. This is after um, uh, the shepherds come to, to visit the, the, the manger. Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in, his, in her heart. Luke 2 19 so two moments in Luke 2 we have Mary treasuring these things and there's a church tradition I want to just finish on this point that Mary is particularly close to John they actually live together um, Joseph has died and Mary is given when Jesus is dying on the cross he, he brings Mary into the care of the beloved disciple John and they share uh, a home together in Ephesus and I wonder, in a way, we have that tremendous prologue in John's gospel where John is talking about the word being made flesh and the word coming into the world. And I sometimes wonder where John receives that from. Where, where does he get that information, that picture? My suggestion is Mary, who has treasured these things. You know, Luke and Matthew talks about, you know, the kind of facts of the birth and, and, the, and the Bethlehem story. But John sees into the real true meaning of what is happening and i think for me maybe i can't prove this of course but maybe the source for the prologue of john is mary's own faith her own memories that which she's treasured she's carried that with her from there when jesus was a baby now in the temple when jesus is a teenager she's seen him die on a cross she's now part of the resurrection community she's, she's getting old with, with john in ephesus and all this is poured out and john says i'm going to write this down and this is the opening of my gospel uh it's it's so wonderful this this is the treasure of mary through the holy spirit's power in her life i don't know but I, it just makes me want to focus on that and then the curtain closes on Luke's gospel. Um, you know, we then have a time of silence until the ministry of John the Baptist and uh, the voice crying in the wilderness. And this is where Mark's gospel begins. So we're left now at the end of this section thinking, what happens next? And Luke skillfully invites us to go into the rest of the material. And he does exactly the same thing following the resurrection. He invites us to take the next step into the book of Acts to find out what happened next. So the curtain is closed, but the second act will begin. And if you come back tomorrow night, we'll be looking at 
the teaching ministry of Jesus, we could look at lots of material, but I just wanted to focus on Luke 15, as I felt that was the, the significant material. So, sorry, I've gone a little bit over my 45 minutes, but I hope some of that is helpful. But what I really want you to do is to be excited by these stories in Luke chapter 2, and you'll read them again, maybe one or two of the commentaries I mentioned, and uh, um, it will be a really healthy diet to read and study this during the period of Advent. So thank you for listening. Uh, thank you. I think I've got 31 participants online tonight. And uh, uh, again, give me some feedback if you want to, or go with your questions to Jane. But thanks for listening. And I hope I might see some of you tomorrow night. Back to you, Jane. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much, Alex. Um, it's brilliant. I mean, I should certainly be back tomorrow night. And I just hope everybody else will be too. Um, I just think you bring Luke alive. It's uh, just really clear. And it's so grounded in its Jewish roots that you can't think of Luke without thinking of the Jewish roots. Um, now, I think some people will have questions or comments and don't forget to email them to enquiries at cmj.org or janem at cmj.org. Um, I do have a couple of questions here and uh, I want to, Alex, if, if that's okay, you're all right with a couple of questions. Yeah, I'm okay with the questions. If the answers, I'm less confident. <laughs> well, you said about the end of the gospel, and you were saying they were worshipping Jesus. Um, it's interesting because the verse before is just disappeared from view. So I think they would be absolutely gobsmacked. And by then, of course, they believed he is the son of God, and they are worshipping him, and they go back with great joy to Jerusalem. Um, and then it says they continue in the temple, like you said. So we know that Jesus was Torah observant. We know that he lived, he showed people how to live the Torah. But yet it says in the Torah that God is one. So how are you reconciling Jesus as son of God? And also he believes the Torah, that God is one. Well, thanks. Thanks, Jane, for asking a nice, easy question to start. Yeah, I mean, look, I, 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 think, I think for me, the, the theology of the divinity of Jesus, or what we might call the Christian Trinity, because we talk about the divinity of the Holy Spirit and divinity of the Father, is not a theology which, which precedes our experience. Our experience of the risen Jesus and the early church, the, the, the church is rooted on the fact that this dead body of a human being was, was risen, and that trans changes everything. But it's not just the risen Jesus, it's also the encounter with, with his spirit, the Holy Spirit, is the presence of Christ in our lives. So if you are a person who, who met the risen Jesus and you have experienced the baptism in his spirit, you, your, your, your experience begins to shape your theology. So you cannot speak about the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob without speaking about God, the Father, the Son and the Spirit. So it's, it's, it's the experience of the risen Jesus in the spirit, which actually helps you to enlarge your understanding of God. And the Christian Trinitarianism is rooted in biblical monotheism. As, as we know, the, the oneness of God in the Old Testament is, is not a singularity oneness. Mm. It, it involves a plurality in the sense that a husband and wife are two people. But guess what? They're one flesh. Mm. So I think biblical monotheism, Jewish monotheism, doesn't necessarily lead to a Trinitarian understanding of God, but it is not opposed to it. And I think this is the experience of the early Jewish believers who were rigidly monotheistic. Here is where the Lord our God is one. But guess what? In the light of what's happened, we have to declare that God is one, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, my little book, Walking an Ancient Path, actually deals with some of those issues. But I agree with you. If we're talking to religious Jewish people, who are unsure about Jesus. One of the key issues which comes up again and again is in what sense I can respect Jesus as a great teacher mm. or whatever, but you, you go too far on, mm. on, on the divinity of Jesus and we have to engage with that well. And there's lots of resources which can help us. Mm. CMJ is putting out a new evangelism course. We're doing some stuff online. And I think um, Oliver does some teaching, one of our CBEs, community-based evangelists, deals a little bit about this. And I, I mentioned it briefly in my session there, but there's lots of good books on this. My little book here is, is just a starter on that. So if you're interested in that, you may want to get this and have a little walk. Uh, it's called Walking an Ancient Path. So, yeah, for me, 
the Trinity comes out of the experience of the resurrection and, and the outpouring of the Spirit. And the word that you said, I mean, Echad in, in the, the Shema, you were saying it's it's a oneness of two people or more or yeah, I think that, yeah, I think I think you know the teaching is, isn't it, that the, the particular Hebrew word there is deliberately chosen. Other words could have been used, mm, yeah. which could have referred to an absolute singularity. Um, but I think in the biblical material, um, it, it gives that opening to understand Christians mm. are monotheistic. We are rooted in one God, mm, mm. but we cannot say what we mean about God without mm. talking about three persons within the Godhead. Now, language is always difficult because we're not using the word person in the same way most people hear the word person. But we are saying something very precise and something, and, and this developed over, over, over years, but I believe it is rooted in the faithfulness to the whole of scripture. Um, so- um, oh, That's very interesting, thank you. Um, another thing you said, um, Jesus is the light to the Gentiles or the, the nations. Yes. Um, and immediately I, it makes you think, oh, we think he came for the Gentiles. But can you expand on that? Because Jesus is Jewish and he came for the Jewish people. Yeah, I mean, obviously, the, the context of the first part of the book of Acts is that the people who are caught up in this Jesus movement, people who experience his resurrection and are kind of transformed by his spirit are entirely Jewish. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's not, you know, until quite a little bit later, we're not quite sure the time scale, different people, put different years on it. But eventually the message is, is shared to the wider world. But the Jewish believers are kind of wrestling with, is this okay? You know, we know Jesus has come for the glory of Israel. He's the Messiah of Israel. He, you know, he, can these non-Jewish people get into this as well? Can they, can they join the party uh, or not? And really that's something which is wrestled with. Now we know the history, we read it back, knowing what's gonna happen. We know what the Council of Jerusalem said. We know how the early church developed. We know how the ministry went out to the corners of the world. And, and after about 40 years, the church no longer was, was majority Jewish. It became more and more Gentile. We know that, but that's reading back on history. At the time, you know, it's, very likely that may not have been the case. The church may have stayed within that Jewish contours. Gentiles may come in, but you have to become Jewish. You have to become a Jewish proselyte. And Paul and others are saying, no, 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 this is not what it's about. Yes, of course, Jesus is for Jewish people. And Paul says, especially for Jewish people, there's a priority there, but it's never, never exclusive. That was never the part of God's plan. And the early church is wrestling with that. And the New Testament, really, when you read the letters, the issue of how can Jews and Gentiles be united in the Messiah, but remain, we're one, but we're not the same. It's a bit like one God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. The Spirit is one, is God, but he's not the same as Jesus. So it, it, we are one in, in Messiah, but if you're Jewish, you remain Jewish. If you're Gentile, you remain Jew Gentile. And what matters is we all love Jesus. But, we, but our Jewishness or our Gentileness is part of our creation and that's something which we treasure. Um, and it, so if you're Jewish, you treasure that. If you're Gentile, you treasure that. But the biggest treasure of all is knowing Jesus. Mm. Sorry, I've gone off the point a bit. But no, that's interesting, <laughs> thank you. I can think of loads more things to say, yeah. but there's just one, I'm not going to go down the different um, alleys, but just one more thing. And that is that there's quite a debate. I mean, we call Jesus, Jesus has come down to us as Jesus. And of course, he would be known as Yeshua or Yoshua. Yeah. And uh, I would like you to comment on that. And should we actually be calling him by his, you know, his Hebrew name? Well, no, okay. <laughs> now, that's very interesting you ask it, because I don't know if you know this. If you do, it's, uh, it, this might look a bit prearranged, but it's not. I, I don't think you do know this. But we do these olive press papers three or four times a year. They've been going coming out for years. They've got a good reputation in colleges and among church leaders. Now, the next one is on the Emmaus Road, and that's what I mentioned at the beginning. I'm going to pinch some of the ideas from the writer of that, a guy called Frank Boo, who does a brilliant job. So I'm, I'm going to acknowledge this. But the one after that is by a guy who is written on this very issue. His name is Yeshua. He makes in his audit press paper, which will come out early in 2023, the case that we should call Jesus Yeshua. Now, I don't think CMJ would endorse that view, but we need to hear it. We need to engage with it. What's written in the Olive Press papers are not necessarily the view of CMJ, but they're written and shared 
thinking that they open up a debate in a helpful way. And uh, Leo's paper on, on the Yeshua argues for that very powerfully. And some of us might agree with it, some of us might disagree, some of us may be unsure. But if you want to look at that issue, get the Nick's Olive Press paper, which I think is the first one in 2023. But we'll, we'll wait and see. We look forward to that then. Yep. Um, there's a comment just down here, Helen Chilton. She says, no questions, but thank you so much for tonight. I found it really helpful and different. Sorry, I can't make tomorrow. Hopefully I can catch up afterwards. You can catch up afterwards um, because these will be uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, but that's no excuse for the football. <laughs> so anyway, I've just got one or two more uh, of these notices just at the end. And, here we are. and just want to look at this, Alex, if that's OK. Sure. Yeah. And, hmm, yeah. It says, we said that you're welcome to come to us anytime um, because we're always open. The website is always there for you. Um, come and see what we do. See more of what Alex teaches because he, every month he uploads a blog and it's so much, so well worth reading it. Um, and then we've got all these social medias, as I said at the beginning, we've got six ways that you can be in touch with us. So, and also the sign up forms. If you're not a supporter or a member, you can easily become one by looking on our website, finding it. If you want to give, you may give, and there's the QR code there. But most of all, I want to say tomorrow night, Luke 15, I'm really looking forward to it because I, I love the parables in Luke 15. And, uh, and there's another study by Alex tomorrow at half past seven, Wednesday evening. Please tell your friends to come along and listen to Alex Jacob teaching. So once again, it just remains for me to say, thank you so much, Alex. I've really appreciated your teaching. And we think we've had a great evening. Thank you. Thank you. And hope to see some of you tomorrow. God bless. Thank you, everybody. See you tomorrow. <laughs>